I'm Mike, and today I have been informed that my Herbivores video has been entirely debunked in the comments, so this is gonna be fun. If you haven't watched the original video, it is linked below. Let's look at some of the points that people used to debunk my video, and, well, that video could use an update anyway, so let's get started. First of all, let me reiterate my main point, that we are best suited to be herbivores, that the human body does best solely on plant foods, not that we never ate meat. Furthermore, that we never adjusted anatomically to eat a calorically significant amount of meat or other animal products. Okay. Let's jump right into the longevity point. I mentioned that the Okinawans were not just the most herbivorous culture, but also the longest living culture. And people responded with, hey, well, if you look at what they eat now, they actually eat a lot of meat. And to that I have to say, yes, and that is why their health and longevity is rapidly declining. Here's a chart showing what they used to eat in 1940, which as we know was 97% herbivorous, and now what they eat today. A massive shift toward animal products with 350% saturated fat consumption, which is primarily from animal products. In a couple generations, they went from some of the thinnest Japanese to some of the most obese Japanese. And this is all pretty sad, and it also shows that as an herbivorous culture becomes more omnivorous, their lifespan goes down. There's actually a more herbivorous, longer living population than the Okinawans ever were, and that is the Adventist vegetarians, the longest living population ever studied, which eats no meat at all. And about 20% of that population is fully vegan. To put a face to this, here is a 100 year old vegan Adventist, Dr. Ellsworth Wareham, who's a retired heart surgeon, and has been vegan for nearly 50 years. Robust would be one way to describe Dr. Ellsworth Wareham. The 100-year-old retired heart surgeon occasionally does his own yard work. He walks regularly, still drives. If you gave me uh, something to memorize, I would memorize it just as quickly now as I would uh, when I was 20. How is your health? Oh, superb. I haven't got an ache or a pain. The great-grandfather believes his plant-based diet plays a big part in all this. The point is, the longest living population ever studied is also the most herbivorous. And on the other hand, you have the Inuits, who are widely known to be the least herbivorous, and among people that are not war-torn, they have a very low life expectancy, about 10 years lower than surrounding populations. I have a whole video on this, and yes, much of it is socioeconomic, but even their mummies had atherosclerosis or clogged arteries, so no, it was not their modern Western diet. Final point on this, what do all the blue zones around the world have in common, the places that live the longest? That is, they all eat a plant-based diet. All right, moving on. Another debunked point of mine was that we have a natural aversion to killing animals that we are not psychologically fit to be omnivores. And the response in many cases was that it is social conditioning that allegedly makes us too pussy to kill, and that many people just experience no such disgust while dismembering animals. And finally, that they would rather kill than cuddle many of the super cute baby animals that I showed. Which is scary. Then why? Please tell me why slaughterhouse workers get PTSD so regularly and so damaging that researchers have considered it, quote, an ultra-hazardous activity for psychological well-being. Nobody, I mean nobody, has PTSD from working at a broccoli packing plant. More accurately, I would say it is the other way around, that we are socially conditioned to suppress our feelings about how we love animals, yet we kill and eat animals. Another debunked point of mine was that our intestine to body length ratio matches out of other herbivores at about 10 to 1. People said, hey, well, if our body length is actually 10 times less than our intestine length, then we'd only be about two and a half feet tall. But my fault for not clarifying body length I was referring to trunk length, technically, which is the length between your shoulders and your butt. This way we can compare animals to other animals and not count, say, a giraffe's neck or an alligator's tail or something like that. And yes, we do fit right in that herbivore category. One of the most common yet unsubstantiated points was that we can't digest cellulose, therefore we aren't herbivores. I only eat plants and I honestly, I don't know how I'm alive right now. All the fruit is just 100% cellulose and all the starch I eat is all cellulose and the veggies, it's, it's just cellulose. In all seriousness, there are types of herbivores that rely on cellulose and those are ruminants. We are not ruminants and there are many other herbivores that are not ruminants like frugivores. 
Finally, we still actually need cellulose. It's called dietary fiber. And no, we might not be able to extract a significant amount of energy from it. We still very much need it for a healthy microbiome. For example, it creates propionate, which we really need. A lack of fiber puts you at risk for a variety of diseases, as I mentioned in my last video, diverticulitis. There are just so many health consequences of not eating enough plants that we just don't get from not eating enough meat. For example, scurvy. We get scurvy from a lack of vitamin C. Well, it turns out we ate so many plants throughout history that when our vitamin C mechanism malfunction in our DNA, it was just fine. The sequence for making our own vitamin C can still be seen hanging there, broken in the human genome. Next, apparently I didn't cover B12 enough because many people in the comments still believe that was the reason we require meat. I have an entire video on this which will be linked below. The main points are B12 is created from bacteria. That's where animals get it and we can easily get enough from untreated water. We can also get it from soil and trace amounts of feces because they have B12 too. But today we treat our water with chemicals. We shower and wash our hands very often in comparison. We also power wash our vegetables and our soil is largely depleted of its microbial biodiversity, which is in part why they give B12 supplements to livestock now. Oh, and we also have toilet paper. So in an unhygienic, unsterilized caveman world, B12 is everywhere. You know, I think I'm gonna actually have to give up because I just found a comment that fully debunks my video. According to this guy, calcium can only, only be found in dairy. So I have no idea how humans survived until 10,000 years ago when we started milking cows. <laughs> oh my God. Here's some plant sources of calcium anyway, just because. Another point that I had was, if you want to call us omnivores just because you can find us eating meat, then you're going to have to call a cat, which is normally considered a carnivore, an omnivore as well, because they can be found eating grass. The response was, cats don't actually subsist on grass, they just use it to aid digestion. Well, eating is eating, but I'll let you have that one. Another one of equal importance would be, you have to call a deer an omnivore because because deer can be seen eating baby birds. Bottom line, what we are observed eating isn't necessarily what is best for us. Sort of ridiculous example, here's a French dude that ate an entire plane. This does not mean that his body is best suited to be a planivore. And this is how it works with the human body in animal-based foods. Eating them gives us disease and over time kills us, much like how if you feed a cat cat food with grains, over time it will get diabetes and die. They won't instantly die, but they will get disease and their lifespan will shorten. It's a bit like alcohol with humans. They can drink it for a long period of time, but then it can lead to disease. And so alcohol, like meat, both give us disease over a long period of time. Eating animal products clogs our cardiovascular system, which leads to our main killing diseases like heart disease and stroke, and also just inhibits day-to-day -day life through things like obesity and erectile dysfunction. I mean, red meat is a probable carcinogen for a reason, and that is because of things that exist naturally in meat, like heme iron. Do you think that an omnivore would get cancer from eating meat? No. It is that belief that we are omnivores that kills us more than anything else. Plants and being an herbivore helps us get over these diseases. As studies by Caldwell Esselstein and other doctors show, an herbivorous diet unclogs arteries within weeks and reverses heart disease. Back to the 100-year-old vegan Dr. Ellsworth Wareham, who, yes, is a retired heart surgeon. If your blood cholesterol is under 150, your chances of having a heart attack are pretty small. Now, my blood cholesterol is 117. There's no chance of me having a heart attack. If you have somebody that you care about, that is the disease that they will most likely die from. And as we see from studies, yes, a vegan diet gives you a 25% lower chance of dying from heart disease. Or maybe you had a relative that died of diabetic complications. Well, vegan slash herbivorous populations have been shown to have 68% less diabetes than the surrounding population. That's 68% less chance of dying from diabetes for someone you care about. Anecdote alert, my girlfriend put her friend's sister on a vegan diet. She is blind due to diabetes and within a few weeks, she no longer needed to take insulin. If people didn't tell her she was an omnivore her whole life, maybe she would still be able to see. Next, I tried to present some super credible doctors that believe we are not suited to eat meat. And people kind of responded with, yeah, some doctors might think that, but there are no evolutionary biologists that say that. 
that is wrong, but since this video is already getting so long, I'll just cover one. Here's Nathaniel Domini, a professor of anthropology at Dartmouth. I'm a biological anthropologist, so I'm interested in how humans and non-human primates um, discern and acquire food resources and how the act of acquiring those food resources may have exerted a selective pressure on their anatomy in particular. Behaviorally, people are plastic and some people eat meat, but uh, anatomically I would say we're not adapted to meat at all. Our, our teeth are too big, our enamel's too thick, the cusp on our teeth are too short. You could say that we've evolved uh, a face and a mouth that's uh, for eating something else that's not meat, and uh, most people believe that's plant foods. So because there's not a very strong match between meat consumption and increasing gradual increases in brain size, scientists have looked to other options. And given that plant foods are such an important part of modern humans that hunt and gather foods, um, the money is on plant foods and a shift in the kinds of plant foods as being the major driving factor in, in increasing brain size. A mix of plant foods with a large amount of starch coming from tubers and seeds. That's the, that's the fundamental component of the human diet. In the end, we need to shift our understanding of what foods are best for us. Clearly, our self-categorization as omnivore is not working out that well for us. Maybe if more people acted like we were herbivores, then we could have more than just one blue zone in the US, which is coincidentally Loma Linda, California, where the vegetarian Adventists live, and eventually more than just a handful of blue zones across the entire world. All right, that's it for today. But if you are going to try and debunk this video also in the comments, please, please use citations. The last video, virtually none of the hundreds of comments trying to debunk the video had any citations. So please do that. All right, thank you for watching and see you next time.